Last weekend of Advent, first Sunday of, of uh, 2020, and it's a communion Sunday too. Um, we're going to be in chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians, chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians. And um, this is known kind of as the final warning, just to give a little bit of an update on 2 Corinthians. Um, the, the, the title of this message is, Are You Ready for 2020? And I think as we stand at the beginning of the year, we do need to ask the question, are, are we ready for 2020? Are you ready for the new year? Are you ready for what's going on? I think it's always important at the beginning of a new year to ask yourself, am I ready for this new year? Um, a little bit of background on 2 Corinthians real quick. 2 Corinthians is probably my favorite book of the whole New Testament. But 2 Corinthians is Paul's most personal letter. It is by far Paul's most personal letter. Uh, many scholars refer to it as Paul's letter of tears. As Paul says that, that, that it's with heavy heart that he writes it. Because you see, Paul is being questioned. He's actually being challenged by this group of, of, uh, of Judaizers that comes in that he refers to as the super apostles. And they're challenging his apostleship. Actually, what we're reading out of chapter 13 is a section of chapters 10 through 13. And this is just for, for any uh, theology nerds out there like myself. 2 Corinthians chapters 10 through 13 is considered to be some of the best examples of Greek rhetoric and oratory ability in the entire Bible, okay? Uh, back then, during this time, there was this group of people that the Greeks would call the sophists. The sophists were actually professional speech givers, and people had their favorites that they rooted for, like the way we root for football teams or basketball teams. And, and Paul really shows off how, how truly gifted uh, he is. Uh, especially in these last three chapters, four chapters. You'll also hear a little bit of what I, is referred to as the Pauline Paradox. Paul uses this thing called the Pauline Paradox a lot. He uses a lot in 2 Corinthians, where he'll say stuff like, when I'm weak, I'm strong. When I'm poor, I'm rich, right? It's, it's paradoxical. And Paul uses it to demonstrate the world versus the, the, the values of, of the kingdom, right? And we're going to be reading all of chapter 13, we're going to be reading all of chapter 13 if you want to follow along in your Bibles. The message is going to focus on verses 5 through 7. We're going to read all of 13, but the focus for the message is going to be chapters 5 through 7. So starting in verse 1. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but that so you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent. That when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up and not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instruction and for your guidance, Lord. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would be with us and fill this place and fill our hearts and fill our minds and open our ears to hear the message that you have for us. We love you, Lord, and we ask for all this in your precious and beautiful name, amen. 
So let's hear again those verses that we're going to focus on here. I just read them out of the NIV. In the NRSV, it says this. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed. But we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. In the Living Bible, which is a little more of a thought-for-thought translation, it says it this way, and I I like this one too. Starting at verse 5. Check up on yourselves. Are you really Christians? Do you pass the test? Do you feel Christ's presence and power more and more within you? Or are you just pretending to be Christians when actually you aren't at all. I hope you can agree that I have stood the test and truly belong to the Lord. I pray that you will live good lives, not because that will be a feather in our caps, proving that we teach what is right. No, for we want you to do the right thing, even if we ourselves are despised. Brothers and sisters, the year 2020 is upon us. And I think that these are valuable questions that we need to ask ourselves and to challenge ourselves with as we stand at the outset of a brand new year. You know, one of the most memorable and fearful times that I can remember when I attended middle school many years ago was this one particular day when I walked into my history class with Mrs. Hahn. And I sat down and I heard these words. Children, clear your desk. Take out a sheet of paper and a pencil. Pop quiz on last night's homework. Man, I remember the fear and the anxiety that it caused me because I wasn't quite sure how well I was going to do. And you know why I wasn't sure how well I was going to do? Because I didn't do my homework. (laughs) Right? I've had to face out of the tests in the ninth grade, an American history test in the tenth grade, and chemistry tests in the eleventh grade, and Spanish composition exams in the twelfth grade. And then there were final exams that I took all through school, ACTs and SATs. And then when I went to grad school, I had to take the GRE and the GMAT and the LSAT. There were thesis challenges and defenses that had to be made and given. Brothers and sisters, everywhere you turn, there is a test or an examination to take for some reason or another. And even apart from school, there's driver's tests, which are written and on the road. To play sports, you have to take physical exams. And then there's tryouts, which are like tests. And then if you're getting ready to go into the hospital for whatever reason or you don't feel well, there's blood tests and stress tests and skin tests and internal dye tests. And then not forgetting that there's eye exams and dental exams and hearing exams and pregnancy tests. For Fairhaven, for us as a church this year, there's the Bible reading challenge, which isn't really a test, but it sort of is. And you can have psychological examinations and emotional examinations, and I'm sure that there are many, many others that I couldn't remember as I started listing them out. There's all kinds and sorts of reasons for giving tests and for taking examinations. And the main reason is to collect data or to make an assessment on what or what is on what is or isn't known. And the Bible is similar. You see, the Bible is not excluded from the practice of examinations. Biblical tests go beyond the physical and the psychological and the emotional. Because the Bible at its core is a spiritual examination. For instance, the psalmist reflects on how God tests to examine the heart. In Psalm 17, the psalmist writes, You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night, and you have tried me and found nothing. The psalmist again in Psalm 26 asks the Lord to examine him. In 26 verse 1, it starts, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord. Prove me and try my reins in my heart. In Psalm 139, the psalmist writes, starting at verse 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any wickedness in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And Jeremiah joins in. In chapter 3 of Lamentations, when he writes, Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Paul again encouraged the Corinthian believers to examine themselves when it came to the Lord's Supper, which we're going to celebrate today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul wrote, But let every man and woman examine themselves, and so let them eat of the bread and the cup. For those who eat and drink in an unworthy manner, eat and drink judgment onto themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. Paul also exhorted the Galatians to take an exam on their work in the Lord. In Galatians 6, Paul writes, But let each one examine their own work, and then they will rejoice in themselves alone and not in another. And please note, brothers and sisters, that there is a balance in the scripture for both God examinations, where God is examining you, and for self-examination, when you have to examine yourself. And what we read this morning in our passage, Paul is exhorting the Corinthians to do some self-examination, some self-examination. So let's start at the beginning. 2 Corinthians was the most difficult letter that Paul had to write because it was one he had to write validating his own apostleship. And I want you to think about what that means for a moment, that Paul, after all of the labor, after all of the sacrifices and hardships, after all of the suffering that he endured among them, that they, the very people that he loved, would question his authority in Christ. And those brothers and sisters truly are pains that resonate especially with the pastor. Those are the pains of the ministry. I remember one time real early on when I was going to school, both a professor and Pastor Kelsey repeated something to me that I repeat to people in seminary all the time. They say that to be a pastor, you need to have the heart of a dove, but the skin of a rhino. The heart of a dove, but the skin of a rhino. Because it's hard. And Paul was validating this for the very people he loved. According to Paul in verse 3, those Corinthians were still seeking proof that Paul was a genuine apostle. And they would have it when he arrived. Now in the response that Paul gave, they may have gotten even more than what they bargained for, however. For Paul was going to use his apostolic authority and power to deal with any sin and rebellion that he found among them. But before he would arrive to Corinth, he challenges the Corinthians to take a test. He challenges the Corinthians to take a test. He then takes the emphasis off of the authenticity of his apostleship and moves it to the genuineness of their conversion. Right? He moves from the authenticating his apostleship to having them prove the genuineness of their conversion. And here's what Paul instructs them to do. In verse 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus is in you unless indeed you fail to pass the test? Now in the King James, they use a word there called unless you are a reprobate. And we're going to get to that word because that's an interesting word that we don't use very often today. But it means just what it says in the way we read it. Jesus is in you unless you fail the test. Or put it another way, and to quote one of my favorites, Ice Cube, when he says, you got to what? you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's what he's saying. you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Brothers and sisters, there is where our points lie for today. One is to examine yourself, and two is to prove yourself. You need to examine yourself, and you need to prove yourself. So in our text, in the original grammar, it places great emphasis on the pronouns yourself and you. Because you see, in essence, Paul turned the tables on his accusers. 
And instead of presuming to evaluate his apostleship, which was given by Jesus Christ, the reality is that they needed to test the genuineness of their faith. So brothers and sisters, it is time. It is time. It is time to take the test. And by taking the test, I mean you and I need to take the test. It is good for all of us every now and then to stop and do some introspection. It is good to take a time to take the focus and look inward and gauge where your personal foundation lies. So in the words of Mrs. Hahn, I want you all to clear your desks. I want you all to take out your pencils and your Bibles. And this is going to be a test. And I'm going to be nicer than Mrs. Hahn. You guys can keep your Bibles with you and it can be open book. So let's start this test. First, we need to examine ourselves. Or as I just said earlier, you need to check yourself. You need to check yourself. Examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Prove yourselves. Don't you know that you yourself are in Christ Jesus unless you fail the test? Unless you fail the test. The word examine that you use in the Greek is pyranzo. And what it means is to objectively scrutinize, to go about and to test yourself. What Paul does is he, what does Paul want us to examine then? Well, he wants to examine if we really have faith. You see, the word faith that's used there in the Greek, pistis, in the text it means moral conviction, especially reliance upon Jesus Christ for salvation. So in other words, the question that is being asked is this. Are you a true believer? Are you a true believer? And please, brothers and sisters, I ask you, don't rush to answer that question. Because how you answer that question is going to tell everything about you. Not just how you turn the test in, but how you answer it. Because it may not be a teacher collecting a test from you that will know the answer, but it will be Christ when he collects your life from you that will know the answer. Brothers and sisters, you need to ask yourself, is Christ in you? Paul exhorts every individual in the church to ask themselves that question. This, of course, is because all wrong behavior eventually leads to that question. Somewhere, somehow, when we are out of line with Christian standards, we have to ask ourselves, am I a true Christian or am I a counterfeit? A am I a true Christian or am I a phony? Have I been saved? Have I been born again? Or am I just putting up a front for people to see? Those of us who are Christians ought to ask ourselves occasionally, if not regularly, these questions. It is a good idea to examine yourself. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying here, especially if there is any kind of consistently wrong behavior involved. And don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. All <coughs> saints are sinners. All saints are sinners. We all make mistakes. We all need help. No one is good. But if there is consistent, consistent, consistent bad behavior, someone has to say to themselves, what's going on here? What's going on here? Or as I used to like to say all the time, that if I would go to church for several weeks in a row, and I didn't feel convicted at some point, something is wrong with me. Something's wrong with me. Because I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. <clears throat> Now, the very fact that the apostle can ask a question like that indicates that that is a mark of true Christianity. You see, a Christian, of course, is not simply one who joins a church. Many people feel that that is the criterion, but it is absolutely not. There are millions of church members all over the world today who are not Christians. Nor does adhering to a certain moral standard in your life make you a Christian, nor the fact that you consistently read the Bible make you a Christian, nor the fact that you sing Christian songs with great enthusiasm or pray before sporting events. None of those things make you a Christian. The thing that really marks you as a Christian 
is if Jesus Christ is living inside of you. You see, a true Christian is someone in whom Jesus Christ dwells and finds himself at home with. And the person in whom Jesus Christ dwells will have certain inescapable evidence of that fact apparent to themselves. And that is what Paul is suggesting that we ask ourselves. Brothers and sisters, here's another tough question. Do you have evidence that Jesus Christ lives in you? Do you have evidence that Jesus Christ lives in you? Has a fundamental change occurred at the very depth of your being? This is actually the question when we ask it all those many ways. The actual question is this. Are you really saved? Are you really saved? You know, the word saved is a term that has fallen into wrong use sometimes. And we're a little loose with it. You know, many people who merely change their actions a little bit for a little while will jump up and say that they're saved. And people are using that term about everything today. But this is the question that Paul is asking. Paul is asking, are you truly and permanently different because Jesus Christ has come to live with you? Are you truly and permanently different because Jesus Christ has come to live with you? You know, I always think about this, just to go off track here, the story of Lazarus and how Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? We don't know much about what happened with Lazarus after that, but I'm going to go out on a limb here. After he came out of the tomb and unwrapped himself, and he's talking to his dad and his sisters and his family, and Lazarus like, wait, let me get this straight. I was dead for three days and Jesus came and let me out. Like, is that what happened? Yeah, Lazarus, that's what happened. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that from that day forward, Lazarus' life was never the same. Was never the same. Now that happened to Lazarus physically, but guess what? That happens to each and every one of us spiritually. Because we're dead. Dead, dead, dead until Jesus Christ comes and brings us back to life. Spiritually, Why should we ever act like we did before that moment then? We shouldn't. That brings us to point number two. Prove yourself. Verse five, examine yourself. Whether you're in the faith, prove yourselves. Don't you know that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? The Greek word prove there is the same Greek word for text that's used in the Bible. Don't get my piso. And it means to approve, to discern, to know by implication. So what does that mean? Another way that we can know is that we will have an inner witness. Now you might be asking, how might I know that? Or how can I know that? Easy. The answer is found in several places in the scripture. For instance, the scripture speaks of an inner witness in Romans chapter 8. Because in Romans 8, Paul says, God's spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We have an inner witness. That is one way that you can know. This inner testimony, an assurance, a sense that is produced with the Holy Spirit who dwells within us that you are part of the great family of God. And if we are really saved, this will be a mark that we have occasionally born in our hearts that the witness of the Spirit tells us and assures us that we are children of God. And there's another way to know this. Are you bearing fruit worthy of your life? Do you love, do you love those in your life? In Galatians 5.22, Paul says that for Christians, the fruit of the Spirit is this. He says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So ask yourselves, don't ask someone else and don't look at someone else. This is self-examination, not other examination. When you look at your life, do I love? Am I patient? Am I kind? Am I generous? Am I faithful? And then ask yourself, if I'm a Christian and none of those things are present in my life, something's probably off. Something's probably off. John chapter 13 Starting at verse 34, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, 
that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. And here's the big one. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love those around you? Do you show love? If you don't show love, if you don't love those around you, something's probably off. So my brothers and sisters, can you answer these things in the affirmative? If you can, then you know. And if you can't, you should stop and take account of your life and take account of your actions. And it might be time to go back and quote from my earlier days to do a checkup from the neck up to understand what is really happening. <laughs> to understand what is really happening, right? I'm sorry, things like that get stuck in my head and I can't get rid of them. <laughs> but you do. But you do. I mentioned earlier the one that says, uh, unless you fail the test in the NIV and the King James, it says, unless you're a reprobate. And that reprobate is a neat word. It's not a word that we hear too often anymore. But the word repro reprobate simply means one who fails a test and is rejected. One who fails a test and then is rejected. Reprobate actually only occurs in the King James Version of the Bible. And it speaks graphically of those whom God has rejected and now left to their own corruption. Jeremiah uses the word reprobate also in chapter 6 when he's talking about counterfeit money by calling it reprobate silver, money that has been rejected, money that hasn't passed the test. So how do we sum all this up, brothers and sisters? We must never approach an examination thinking that it's wrong. We should welcome self-examination. We should welcome self-examination. We should encourage it. We must examine ourselves continually because if we don't, do you know what will happen? You'll be deceived. You'll be deceived. Continually checking yourself. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? You see, the point of the examination is ultimately this. Whether or not you are in the faith or whether or not you're not. And here's some questions that we can use to examine ourselves. Is Jesus Christ in me? If Christ is in me, then am I in him? Brothers and sisters, salvation is not Jesus upon our lips, but rather Jesus within our hearts. Salvation is not Jesus upon our lips. It is Jesus within our hearts. It is Christ living in you and reigning in you as your Lord and as your Savior, which is the hope of glory, which is what Paul writes in Galatians, in Colossians chapter 1. So here's what we're going to do. It's the beginning of the year. And I don't know how you guys are at work, but I know at my work, I'm going to go back tomorrow, and they're going to say some corny things like, it is the beginning of the year. The scoreboard is reset to 0-0. Zero, zero. They, you know, they use all of these dumb cliches and stuff like that, okay? But we're standing here at the beginning of the year. So why don't we start off with a clean slate? And what we're going to do now before we take communion is we're going to do an examination of conscience. We are going to do an examination of conscience. And here's how this is going to work. I would like each of you here to bow your heads. Close your eyes. When I say it, don't do it now. When I say it. And I'm going to read some questions that are based basically off of the Ten Commandments as a way to kind of just check ourselves. Check ourselves and see where we are as we stand here at the cusp of a new year. Because one thing is true, as corny as those cliches are at work, what happened in 2019? Done. That's over. 2020 really is a clean slate. So let's do that. So let's bow our heads. I'm going to read these, and you guys pray along. Read these questions to yourself. Think about them. I'll give you some time between each one. And really see where you stand. And then I'll close with prayer and we'll do communion. So the examination of conscience. Number one. Have I treated people, events, or things as more important than God? <clears throat> Have 
I treated people, events, or things as more important than God? Have my words actively or passively put down God? Have my words put down the church? Have my words put down other people? Do I honor the Sabbath? Do I avoid, when possible, anything that impedes worship to God or joy for the Lord's day and proper relaxation of mind and body? Do I look for ways to spend time with God and my family in worship service on Sundays? Do I show my parents due respect? Do I seek to maintain good communication with my parents where possible? Do I criticize them for lacking skills that I think they should have? Have I harmed another through physical or verbal or emotional means, including gossip or manipulation of any kind? Have I respected the physical and sexual dignity of others and of myself? Have I taken or wasted time or resources that belong to another? Do I give to the church as I should? Have I taken from the Lord by not giving as I should? Have I gossiped? Have I told lies? Have I embellished stories at the expense of someone else? Have I honored my spouse with my full affection and with my exclusive love for them? Am I content with my own means and needs, or do I compare myself to others unnecessarily? Keep your heads bowed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. These trials are only to test your faith, to see whether or not it is strong and pure. It is being tested as fire tests gold and purifies it. And your faith is far more precious to God than mere gold. So if your faith remains strong after being tried in fiery trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor in the day of his return. You love him, even though you have never seen him. Though not seeing him, you trusted him. And even now you are happy with the inexpressible joy that comes from heaven itself. And your further reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Heavenly Father, as we looked inward, as we took this self-examination, Lord, we all failed it. We all have something that we struggle with, Lord God. And Lord, we give that to you. Lord, you are a faithful God who tells us that you will forgive us if we only turn to you, who is sure to be there for us as we turn to you and repent of our ways. And help us, Lord, as we start 2020 to put the things that we struggle with behind us and to put the cross before us. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to always examine ourselves with the standard being you. Be with us in all things, Jesus. And we ask for this in your precious name. Amen.